designer at HoloLens for Microsoft. He's a designer, creative technologist, and author from Seoul, Korea. And as a principal UI designer at Microsoft's HoloLens reality design team, he's leading the design effort for the open source project Mixed Reality T Toolkit, MRTK, focusing on the developer and creator ecosystem experience. And then joining Yoon is Julia Schwartz. She's the principal software engineer at Microsoft, is a researcher and engineer, she works on input and interaction techniques for mixed reality. And since 2015, she's worked uh, to bring instinctual interactions to HoloLens. And in 2018, she led the design and engineering effort to direct manipulation of holograms to HoloLens too. So with that, let me hand it off to Yoon and Julia. Thanks. Hello, everybody. My name is Julia Schwartz, and I'm joined here by Yoon Park, who is a, a designer and my partner in crime in many of these outreach sessions. And uh, we're very excited today to be sharing with you the HoloLens 2 Instinctual Interactions input model, um, sort of how we got there, and more importantly, how you can use these in instinctual interactions and deploy them not just to the HoloLens 2, but to many other platforms such as VR, HoloLens 1, and even your phone using the Mixed Reality Toolkit or MRTK. Now, we don't have very much time, so let's just dive right into instinctual interactions. This is one of the pillars of HoloLens 2, is the instinctual interactions input model, which actually lets you directly reach out and touch holograms. And while it may seem very, seem very obvious to do this, actually a lot of thought and care went into developing this input model. And what I want to do today is give you a little glimpse of all of the prototyping and thinking that we did to arrive at this input model. And then, of course, we'll show you how you can actually bring that into the mixed reality toolkit. I always like to start with the Minecraft cube because this is the first prototype that um, I sort of built that gave people an idea that you could sort of get close to holograms and directly interact with them with your hands. Back when we released HoloLens 1, there was actually this sort of impression that um, you couldn't get close to a hologram, that it would be so uncomfortable that it would burn your eyes out or something. So we had this sort of clipping plane that made it so that when you got close to a hologram, the hologram would disappear. So what we did is we actually just removed that clipping plane, and then instead of using the head cursor as the main targeting mechanism, we used the hand as the main targeting me mechanism. And what we realized was it wasn't as bad as people had feared. We then ran some subsequent studies to understand uh, how the comfort worked, and what we found was that actually uh, it's the change in the focus in depth. So if you have a hologram that's changing in depth a lot, that can cause a lot of discomfort and also changing in focus from uh, a near hologram to something that, that might be far away frequently is what you really want to avoid. But for short periods of time, it's really not that bad. Another thing that we learned from this prototype is the importance of when you sort of pinch and that haptic feedback to also show visual feedback as you do it. So as you can see in this simple example, I'm changing the color of the corner cubes as I grab it. Uh, something you don't see is that I also actually play a sound on grab start and grab release. And all of these audio and visual cues are actually very important for making the experience feel uh, connected. So moving on to the next sort of big prototype, uh, that one was using just the HoloLens one sensing. For the next one, we actually brought in the articulated hands. So for this prototype, we really wanted to understand what would it feel like if you could actually manipulate 3D UI controls with your hands. And we basically thought of every single way that we could move sliders, press buttons, twist knobs, and implemented them and showed these to many people to understand what worked and what didn't. And what we found is that pinch type interactions, uh, interactions where you sort of did a pinch with your hand and then moved it, worked quite well because you get that haptic feedback of one finger touching the other to sort of give you confidence. In contrast, poke type interactions where you kind of had to move your finger through something and then rotate around like with this knob, that worked very well for buttons, but for things like knobs, uh, worked less well. There is uh, also the interaction that everyone always wanted, which was the sort of you frame a, a knob and you rotate it with your, with your hand. And while that sounded good, what we actually learned is that this forces your hand into configurations that are quite difficult to sense. So if you want to actually turn a dial to a particular value, 
using that interaction, it can be quite challenging. We, of course, also learned uh, the importance of, again, visual and audio feedback here. In some cases, the, the, the visual feedback wasn't enough to get, help people be successful. But in general, what we learned from this is people love pressing buttons with their fingers and that this general idea of pinching something and moving is a successful way to manipulate content. So from that, we sort of felt fairly confident that, okay, pressing buttons directly with your finger seems like a good idea. And um, similarly, there's a lot of detail though that goes into actually doing this correctly. So instead of allowing every single button on the every single finger to press buttons, we actually only allow one point of interaction per hand. And the reason for this is to prevent false activations from your other fingers. And we'll get into that a little bit later. So the next thing we sort of looked at was sort of interactions with virtual touch screens. Back when we were starting this research, we actually didn't know if this would work at all. So we weren't sure if you just have a virtual touch screen, would people understand to just directly reach out and touch, touch these touch screens? Would it work at all? And this is sort of where that one point of interaction per hand comes in. Because when we tried to put interactive components on all, all 10 fingers, we actually found a lot of false activations from the other fingers as you would reach in. And this is again, because you are not touching a physical surface. You're actually poking the air essentially. So it's very easy for your other fingers to sort of get in the way as you're doing the interaction. Um, the finger movements uh, that people make when they move in the air are, are quite circular. And so it's very easy to accidentally activate from other fingers. Uh, for example, one thing we tried is we tried pinch to zoom with the index finger and thumb, and that's much harder than it sounds. So what we found works quite reliably is just having one sort of interactive point per hand on the index finger. Uh, another thing that uh, we noticed that I should mention is the importance of a cursor to indicate where you're interacting. So what we actually learned is that it's quite difficult to understand the depth of your hand relative to, say, a touch screen that has a lot of sort of pixels showing up. And in fact, uh, before we added a cursor to sort of tell you not only how far your finger is away from that surface, but where it would land, um, people are actually having a really hard time doing things like clicking links on web browsers. And the funny anecdote I'd like to share is I got lots of reports saying, oh my gosh, this is really difficult. Um, and then we added the finger cursor and those all went away. So the sort of learning for that is um, sometimes when people stop complaining, uh, that's actually a sign that you have some, done something quite well. There's actually a lot of detail that goes into the finger cursor. And uh, for example, uh, we have the shadow on the actual touch screen content. And then you also have the cursor itself on the finger, which is attached to exactly sort of the end of the fingertip and changes size as you get closer to the touch screen. So all of these uh, details are very important for making these interactions feel sure-footed. So going uh, away from pressing things and into grabbing things, as we mentioned before from the 3D UI controls, we had the, this understanding that, okay, it seems like reaching out and directly grabbing something is a, is a good way to go. Something interesting is that the size of the object or the way that you design the handles can impact how people grab. So you can design your handles to be very grab friendly. And in fact, through some uh, studies we did early on, we learned that you can show the, the handles or we call them affordances once and then hide them and people will, will remember that they need to reach out and grab the affordances. When you don't show any affordances at all, people will try to pick up the object as if it was a real object. So from the bottom or try to frame it. I saw people hugging houses or cars to try to pick, pick up large objects. When they saw handles, they would go for the handles instead. So for sort of precise or um, uh, sort of more refined manipulation, we recommend using the bounding box. And then again, finally, going to the importance of audio and visual cues that we've mentioned several times. Um, because you're touching sort of air, you're not actually getting haptic feedback from physically touching surfaces you need to crank up all those other senses. What we learned is it does work. If you show lots of visual feedback, so hover light when you, your hand hovers over an interactive object, change the color when you touch and play a sound. If you look at our buttons, uh, there's a lot of detail where we play a pulse the minute you touch on the button, um, a, a pulse visual and then also a sound effect. So for every single state that you can think of, sort of hovering far, contacting, sort of a button actuation and then release, 
you need to do both audio and visual feedback to give people the confidence that they are actually engaged with the system and the, the system understands them. And that sort of can compensate or give a sense of virtual haptics when you don't actually have a surface to touch. Okay, so that's near interaction. And believe it or not, that was the easy stuff. Um, let me quickly go through far interaction and sort of explain that there are many, many different things that we tried to interact with things at a distance. This is challenging because there's no sort of real world uh, analog to it like we have for things that are within, near our reach. So I wanted to show you some of the many techniques that we tried for interacting with objects at a distance. So starting with finger pointing, the idea here is you sort of cast a ray from your head to your fingertip and that's your point of actuation. Now this can work quite well when you're actually just pointing at things. If I want to see how quickly I can sort of point to those objects, it works great. For actually selecting, what you'll notice is that end point, that cursor moves quite a long way as you do the selection. And so if you're having something, you want something intuitive like a pinch to select, uh, it can be quite challenging. Of course, uh, I've seen people do things like move their thumb to select, but what we wanted is for this to feel instinctual, for you to not sort of have to learn anything. So we wanted the way to do the selection to feel like natural, like a pinch gesture. Okay, the next thing we tried is uh, of course the wrist pointing, which pretty much anybody that tries the hand ray asks me, why didn't we point with the wrist? Um, we tried that, we tried it for quite a while. Usually when someone asks me this, I tell them, uh, please, please go ahead and try because you never know, maybe you will be the one to crack this. There's actually a couple reasons why the wrist pointing doesn't work as well as you might think. One is that as you pinch, the, the ray actually moves significantly because the sensed hand sort of the rotation of your palm or your wrist moves quite a bit more than you would think. And the second is that your wrist actually is not as versatile as you may think, because when you point at things, you use a lot more than just your wrist to do that movement. Um, finally, we sort of landed on the, the technique that was the most stable, which is basically a ray that goes from your shoulder to roughly your palm. And the advantage of this is that it's very stable under selection. So when you do a pinch gesture, the ray doesn't move very much, it allows you to select small items. Of course, uh, some disadvantages are that it requires a lot of hand movement uh, and also it can be hard to challenge things that are sort of low and flat like a table. And we did compare this to the Holland's one input method. And what we actually found is that the hand ray is a little bit uh, easier for newer users to learn. So we wanted to optimize for the new users to make it instinctual and easy to learn, which is why we wanted the hand raise. So um, going for the guidance for hand raise, that's sort of the background or the why we ended up there. And um, this is the guidance for that. Okay, so this is a lot uh, to implement. Oh my goodness, if you had to do this on your own, that could take you quite a while. Um, and this is, uh, of course, why we worked on the MRTK and spent so much time, myself, Yoon, and a team back at Microsoft, and of course, the broader community. We've actually tried to take all these instinctual interaction paradigms and um, distill them into something that you can use called the Mixed Reality Toolkit, or MRTK, so that you don't need to uh, reinvent these items all yourself. Um, there's a lot of little details and little bugs that actually make a really big difference in making these interactions feel so good. And what we do with the MRTK is build these in for you so you can work on your application. So you can see many of these instinctual interaction paradigms that I mentioned, they sort of work out of the box. We have the hand raise, we have two-handed manipulation, um, and then we also bring in access to controls like the keyboard. And we actually innovate on top of the base instinctual interaction model by bringing in new content like the hand menu and tool tips here. And uh, we're gonna go into a lot more detail about how to use these, all these components uh, later on. So as I mentioned a little bit, the Mixed Reality Toolkit, or MRTK, is a collection of building blocks that you can use to build your augmented reality, virtual reality applications. It's got much of the foundational UI components that make up, um, that sort of make up AR applications, and it works not just on HoloLens 2 and HoloLens 1, it works on a broad range of VR devices, and even works on your iPhone and Android phones. So you can actually literally take MRTK, compile it to your Android phone, and it will work. So it's got, uh, does a lot, so we'll just quickly dive into it. Um, here's the, some of the many things that you can uh, do with the, the MRTK. It's got an input system, sort of what you would expect, buttons, 
making object manipulatable, have them uh, follow you around. We provide a lot of uh, pre-made components, such as the near menu and hand menu, that you can uh, hook up with your application logic. Uh, we provide access to the system keyboard on HoloLens 2. And sort of the list keeps going on. We have sliders. We have the touchscreen interactions from the slate. We've got an easy way for you to switch scenes. And we also have many experimental features, which are things that we're trying to working on bringing into the MRTK as we get feedback. And if people like it, we bring them in. And a lot of these experimental features are actually um, contributed by our community. And um, sort of having a, a good community that's filing bugs and, and making these contributions is actually something we really appreciate. So um, MRTK will go into a little bit more detail on the folder structure and how that's set up. And I'm sure Yoon will talk much more about that. Um, but one thing to point out is that the good place for you to start when using MRTK is the hand interaction example scene. That's got most of the user control components that you're going to want to use when building your instinctual interaction applications. And with that, I'm going to go and switch over to Yoon Park, who is going to explain some more parts about MRTK. Let me share my screen. Um, so let me wait for that, the top bar. Oh, cool. Uh, yeah. Uh, so yeah, thank you, Julia. Uh, so yeah, Julia just gave us a great overview of instinctual interactions. So let's take a look at the MRTK starting with the input system. So to interact with the object in this space, you need to set up the basic elements such as input module, camera, and pointer. Um, so with MRTK, you can easily set up a new scene using this mixed reality toolkit menu. So if you click the menu, uh, you will see these two objects automatically added to your scene, mixed reality toolkit, which represents MRTK services, then mixed reality play space, which includes the camera. When you click mixed reality toolkit object, you're gonna see this inspector panel uh, where you can configure all the MRTK services uh, through the profiles. So you can copy and customize and clone to uh, duplicate the profile and configure your own profile. And MRTK also provides some of the default profiles for the devices like HoloLens 2 and uh, Windows Mixed Ray VR headsets. So let's take a look at this input, MRTK's input. So starting from the bottom, so there's a device manager, uh, which also is also known as a data provider, uh, which abstracts uh, different types of devices like a HoloLens and Windows Mixed Reality headset and uh, mobile phone. Then there's the controller, uh, which represents different types of input device. Like it could be your hand, motion controller, or Xbox controller. Then there's a pointer. And in MRTK, we have uh, multiple pointers to interact with the far and near objects. So for example, we are using poke pointer to uh, interact touch and grab, uh, touch and press object. And we are using grab pointer to grab object. And there's a GGV pointer, which is a gauge, gesture, and voice uh, input model from a first generation of HoloLens. And uh, there's a default controller pointer, which is a ray. Uh, which is used for, for our hand ray for HoloLens 2, and as well as the motion controller in VR. Then there's a focus object can receive the input events. Then cursor visualizes this, this visual input state. Then MRTK uh, provides this something called interactable, uh, which allows you to easily add a visual feedback uh, to responding to this kind of different types of inputs. So if you compare this input diagram with the MRTK's profile, uh, input profile, uh, there's a data input pro providers and controllers and pointers. Uh, as you can see, you can see different types of uh, controller prefabs. So in the big picture, uh, the event flow like this uh, is coming from the controller uh, through the pointers and on the focus object, you are interacting with the uh, object. So because MRTK supports uh, 
a flexible input system. Um, so if you just build the same scene and deploy to the different types of devices, it'll automatically uh, pick up and support proper input system. So if you look at the left, uh, the HoloLens first generation uses uh, gaze and gesture. And in the center, there's a Windows Mixed Reality VR headset with a virtual controller. And then on the right side, as you can see, it runs on the mobile devices. So you don't have to modify anything to support these different types of input. Then cursor is also quite important uh, element, uh, which visualizes the, uh, the current input state. So it gives the user improves more uh, users confidence on the interactions. Then there's another interesting uh, elements on the input profile is this hand tracking profile. So under this section, you can customize and configure uh, this prefabs for the joint, hand joint, and hand palm, and the fingertip. And you can also uh, configure uh, the visualization of this hand. In HoloLens 2, you can uh, track uh, this 25 joint per hand for simultaneously for both hands. Um, but however, uh, we, it is recommended to avoid using complex script or expensive logic. Uh, it kind of makes sense because uh, it will really affect the performance. But uh, another reason is that we really want to encourage the instinctual interaction. So you don't want to put another digital uh, object on top of your hand. Um, so, so you can directly, your physical hand can directly interact with the uh, holograms. So for near interactions, you're going to need these uh, scripts. Um, so if you want to touch or uh, press object, you're, you're going to need this near interaction touchable script. And if you want to grab object, uh, you're going to need this near interaction grabbable script. And MRTK provides a very strong input simulation. Um, so using keyboard and mouse, you can easily simulate almost every possible interaction. So for example, you can use a, a WA SDQE a keyboard key to move around, just like a first person shooting key. Then you can use a right mouse button to move around the camera and use shift and spacebar to bring up the hands. And you can use a wheel, mouse wheel to move back and forth the hand. So as you can see, we can easily simulate the hand movement and to push the button in the Unity editor. And of course, it displays proper the finger cursor. And of course, uh, you can also simulate the grabbing behavior. So by just clicking mouse, so you can grab and move the object and of course, if you're moving back, you can use a hand ray as well. And you can use a T and Y key to make the hand persistent. So just like this, uh, you can grab with one hand and using the other hand, uh, you can grab and do this kind of two-handed manipulation. And sometimes you need, uh, you need to rotate your hand, then you can use this control key uh, to hold and rotate the hand with the mouse. And you can easily simulate this kind of hand menu. And you can also configure very detailed hand pose and other options in the this input profile. Yeah, like this, you can also configure the amount of the movement the hand. Uh, so everything you can configure in the MRTK's input profile. And you can also easily simulate the, the gaze input model from for the uh, HoloLens first generation. So uh, you can change this hand simulation mode to gestures to do that. So this is a kind of typical workflow uh, from Unity. You build Visual Studio project, then from there you deploy with uh, as a UDP application to the device. So using MRTK's input simulation, you can uh, dramatically reduce this reduce this uh, iteration time. Uh, but also uh, you can use this uh, Unity's holographic remoting feature. So you can stream your scene directly to the device. So you don't have to deploy your scene and still you can experience everything. Um, so MRTK supports uh, fully articulated hand tracking and eye tracking input in, even in this holographic remoting. So all you need to do is to check this, uh, checking this MS build for Unity support in the MRTK's uh, project configurator. And this is a, a the flow for setting up the remoting, holographic remoting on the window XR. There's a menu called holographic emulation. Um, then in the device, uh, when you go to the Microsoft Store 
in HoloLens, uh, you're going to find this app called Holographic Remoting Player. So if you launch that, you're going to get the IP address. So you can type in this IP address and click Connect. This holographic remoting also supports USB cable connection. So to do that, uh, you need to disconnect from Wi-Fi and again, launch the holographic remoting player app. Then you're going to get this IP address starting with uh, 169. So this is the IP address for this USB connection. So using this, you can achieve more faster and stable uh, connection and simulation. And there are some of the several uh, useful examples in MRTK. Uh, please check it out. So let's take a look at uh, some of the most crucial uh, and widely used UX components in MRTK uh, that are built on top of this input system to achieve instinctual interactions. So let's start with the button. So in HoloLens 2, um, as we described, the button, you can directly interact with the button. So you can directly press uh, and you're gonna see this kind of uh, visual feedback. So we're using it in the start menu and system keyboard and multiple places. And so button is uh, one of the most basic component in the mixed reality, but it is also one of the most complex element in mixed reality because uh, as Julia mentioned, because you are essentially pressing through the air. So there should be a lot of uh, visual and audio feedback to make the user feel confident. Uh, at the same time, uh, we also have to calculate, you know, speed of the fingertip and trajectory, um, the angle, and also have to prevent uh, back pressing when your finger is coming back. So there are lots of educations and uh, the cases they have to deal. So if you use uh, HoloLens 2 button from MRTK, you're gonna get all of those uh, things as a free, for free. So yeah, HoloLens 2 pressable button has a multiple uh, visual feedback such as proximity light, uh, the lighting effect based on your dis distance to your fingertip and focus highlight and compressing cage. And there's a pulse effect on the trigger to indicate when the event is triggered. And this is a structure of the button, of HoloLens 2 button. It's a back plate, front plate, and the icon and text. And if you look at the scripts, uh, there are multiple scripts uh, that constructs this HoloLens 2 button. So if you look at the left side, there's a pressable button uh, which handles all these near interactions. So you can handle the press and touch event. Then uh, but, uh, the script in the center, physical press event router, passes this pressable button uh, event from this pressable button to interactable on the right side. So essentially, if you use this on-click event on the interactable script, then you can handle both for near and far interactions. And uh, as I mentioned before, for to uh, receive uh, this near interaction, uh, you need to add this uh, near interaction touchable script. So HoloLens 2 button provides multiple uh, configurable options such as a distance. You can adjust distance for the when to push and when to start push, when to stop push, and when to uh, trigger event like that. And yeah, you can configure the moving icon between the back and front plate. And of course you can configure the audio feedback and a lot of visual feedbacks are coming from MRTK standard shader. So as you can see on the right side, we are using near fade and proximity light and border light, uh, various types of uh, shader effect to achieve this visual feedback. And recently we had another useful component called button config helper. So using this, you can easily configure this icon of the button. So as you can see, you can simply click to change the icon and easily update the labels, text labels. And this uh, icon supports surprise quad and font. So if you use a, want to use a font, you can use this uh, SDF texture for the text match pro. So under Windows font folder, if you look at the font, there's a font called uh, HoloLens MDL2 font. So inside there, there are lots of useful glyphs you can use. So if you use the, import this font into unit project and use this uh, text match pros font as a creator, then you can generate the texture uh, for this button icon. So you're gonna need this Unicode and uh, you can find this Unicode from our MRTK's button documentation on GitHub.
So to customize this dimensional button, uh, you need to uh, adjust the scale of the some of the components in button. So first one is a front plate. So if you look at the scale, the default scale is a 0 0.032, which is a 3.2 millimeters. So this is the minimum size uh, based on our prototyping and user studies, uh, it's optimal for the hand interaction, uh, pressing with the fingers. So from here, you can modify the dimension of uh, scale, then also need to update the quad and the back plate. And finally, of course, you need to update the box collider size. Then if you look at this near action touchable, uh, you're gonna see, see this warning sign uh, bounds to that match box of collider size. So if you just click this fix bounds button, then it'll automatically adjust everything uh, for you. So this is a kind of step for uh, customizing the dimension. Then of course you can adjust the icon and text and the distance for the events. So if you take a look at the press of a button example scene, you're gonna see various types of uh, button variations. So for example, we have this toggle button and recently we also added this checkbox and toggle switch or HoloLens 2 style and radio buttons. And you can use these radio buttons as a group, um, as you can see. So toggle buttons are quite similar to regular HoloLens 2 button. The only difference is it has this additional components backplate uh, to visualize the toggle state and the selection mode is using toggle in the interactable. And one of the most important things in uh, using the toggle button is using adding this interactable uh, toggle receiver. So when you add this toggle receiver, you're gonna, uh, you're gonna be able to use this on select and on deselect event to uh, leverage this toggle two states. And you can use this script called interactable toggle collection to use these toggle button as a group. So as you can see, it is working as a group. You just simply need to drag and drop the buttons into this toggle list. Another useful uh, recent addition is uh, MRTK's toolbox. So under Mixed Reality Toolkit menu, if you select this toolbox, then you're gonna see this kind of visual library of all uh, great UI components in MRTK. So you can simply click to add to your scene and you can also do the text search to search a specific components in MRTK. So here are some of the design guidelines. So it is recommended to use uh, opaque backplate instead of transparent or uh, translucent backplate. Uh, of course, one of the reasons is uh, it's hard to re recognize when the physical environment is quite complex. And another reason is uh, uh, because HoloLens 2 uses this uh, stabilization technique called depth LSR, depth LSR. And the holograms behind are seeing through this uh, translucent or transparent uh, backplate will uh, show the swimming effect. So it is not recommended to uh, this kind of transparent backplate on the right side. Um, yeah, definitely it is also kind of very noisy and hard to recognize. Another recommendation is if you, you're using multiple button, uh, uh, use this uh, shared backplate instead of uh, using, uh, keeping the individual backplate, uh, that can really reduce the visual noise and also shows a kind of clear grouping. So this is a one example from my personal project. As you can see, it were two groups of a button with a kind of shared backplate uh, that gives you that gives the user more clear uh, uh, group uh, grouping. Then yeah, Julia talked about this fingertip, a finger cursor that communicates the distance to the target objects. So this is an example of a HoloLens 2 shell uh, showing this finger cursor behavior. So based on the distance to the target surface, uh, it changes the size. So it really helps the user's uh, interaction confidence. So if you are interested in, you can take a look at this finger cursor prefab in MRTK and you can find how it is configured. And you can also even customize the fingertip light, uh, the color of the lighting effect. So next building block is the bounding box. So bounding box is the standard UI for scaling and rotating object in HoloLens. So as you can see, you can directly grab and scale and rotate uh, these handles are appearing uh, based on the proximity to the hand. And of course, it supports far interaction as well. So 
Using it is quite simple. You just need to assign a bounding box script on to any object, then you're going to get this bounding box. But uh, by default, uh, you're going to get this uh, the blue cubes and wires, which is a HoloLens first generation style on the left side. So if you want to use HoloLens 2 style, you need to assign some of the additional uh, prefabs and materials and the assets. So it could be a little bit uh, tricky. So I would recommend to just copy style from existing example. So if you go to bounding box example scene, there are multiple coffee cups and one of the left one has uh, this HoloLens 2 style. So using this Unity's gear icon, you can easily copy the component and paste it into your own bounding box object. So bounding box provides some additional options like uh, starting activation options. You can do it manually or based on proximity. It also, you can configure a lot of uh, different types of uh, handle options and assets. And it also supports this proximity based uh, animated uh, subtle behavior. So you can also customize these scales as well. And if you still need a more explicit mode for activating and deactivating the bounding box, you can use this app bar component in MRTK. This is more like a, a first generation HoloLens style. So if you press the adjust button, then it'll show bounding box. And when you're done, you can just press the down button. So next building block is the manipulation. So manipulation handler is one of the most important exciting component in MRTK, which allows you grab and manipulate the object. So you can use a one or two handed interaction and also it supports both near and far interaction, uh, just like this. Uh, again, it's uh, quite simple to use. You just need to assign this manipulation handler script onto any object. And to support near interaction, yeah, again, we need to assign this additional component called near interaction grabable script. Then you can configure options like uh, uh, constraints, and you can also uh, check this uh, show tether when manipulating under near interaction grabble to uh, see this kind of visual uh, line, tether line from the grab point. Um, and also you can use uh, one object to control another object. So this is a useful for the situation when you have a large object like a architectural model. So in this example, I have a large tree and there's a grab handle. So I want to control that tray, large tree with the handle. So in this case, you can just assign the manipulation handler script onto the grab handle. But under manipulation handler, there's a something called a host transform. So here you can assign the target object. Then when you manipulate this grabber, then you're going to manipulate the target tree object. So it's quite useful uh, method. So uh, this is a kind of upcoming release of this. So manipulation handler has been refactored. Now we have a new version called object manipulator. Um, so of course, we're going to keep the original version as well. But the main difference is, uh, so when you look at the coffee cup on the left, which uses manipulation handler, when you grab and move, it does not collide with the spatial mesh. However, the new one with the object manipulator, as you can see, it properly handles the collision between the object and the target spatial mesh. So it's a quite useful uh, improvement. So next building block is the object collection. So with object collection, you can easily lay out multiple objects in the 3D space. Um, so this is a one example uh, using the object collection in periodic table, which is one of our open source sample lab in mixed reality design lab. So as you can see, it supports various types of uh, surface layout type. Um, so using it is quite simple again. So you, you just need to create empty container object and add multiple child and assign this great object collection script on the parent object, then adjust the width and height and the surface type and click update. Uh, update collection. Of course, you can do everything on the code as well. So it supports uh, various types of surface type, like a cylinder and sphere. Uh, so you can achieve very interesting layout in 3D. So check out this object collection example scene to learn more about it. So next building block is the solver. So solver uh, is a collection of uh, various types of object positioning behaviors. Um, so for example, so radio view server, um, using this, you can easily achieve this kind of tag along behavior. 
So make the object follow you within a specific range. So you can specify minimum and maximum distance, distance and the viewing degree. Um, and yeah, surface magnetism server is another useful component. So you can make an object attached to the specific surface on the physical environment, or it could be also a digital object. Uh, you can configure the surface type that you want to attach to. And another recent addition is uh, something called a tap to place. So using this, uh, it's quite similar to surface magnetism, but it also supports additional uh, logic for placing objects. If you just air tap, uh, just like this, it places, you can place the object on a specific point. And of course it supports both hand ray and eye gaze and other uh, controller types. And constant view size is also quite useful. So if you look at the menu, uh, so now I'm interacting with this menu in the near interaction range. Uh, then when I click that, you see the menu automatically scales up when it moves back to maintain this usable target size. So using the hand ray, I can still interact with the uh, comfort. Then another co uh, server component used is in this scene is a in-between server. So that with using that, you can place an object between two objects. So uh, I'm using it in this menu to place the menu to between that target text object and myself. So as you can see, it kind of maintains the uh, ratio between me and the target object. It's quite useful. And billboard is uh, another useful script. So on any object, if you assign this billboard, then you can make the object always face you. So in this example, the tooltip is using billboard script. So to use the server, you, know, you just need to assign one of these server script and it'll automatically add the server handler script as well. Then from here, you can configure the target reference objects. So it could be a head with a uh, HoloLens, or it could be a hand ray or other additional uh, input. So you can check out this server example scenes to learn, learn more about those details. The next topic is near menu. So near menu is the collection of buttons or kind of other UI components and uh, on top of this, uh, the back panel. So it follows you with a tag along behavior and you can also grab and move. So as you can see, you can grab and move and place in the world, uh, it is world locked. So then if you unpin it, it starts to follow you using the tag along behavior uh, achieved by the radio view server. Um, so it's quite useful if you want to make a floating UI and stays around you and you can always kind of lock, word lock in some place and focus on content and come back and unlock and interact with the menu. So essentially it's like just a collection of the HoloLens 2 button and the backplate that uses a manipulation handler and of course the radio view server to achieve the tag along behavior. So you can check out this near many examples in to see uh, various types of uh, examples. So the next topic is the hand menu. So the hand menu is one of the most uh, widely used, uh, most popular component in HoloLens 2 interaction. Uh, so as you can see, you can quickly bring up the menu and do a quick action and hide it. So you can use this uh, hand constraint palm up screen, uh, which is also another server uh, to achieve this behavior. So you can simply uh, assign your object on this event. And you can also use these additional options on the palm up section, uh, such as a require flat hand and follow hand until facing camera to achieve uh, prevent false positive and show the natural movement. So this is an example of using uh, follow hand camera facing threshold, uh, facing camera, until facing camera. So as you can see, it rotates with the hand until faces, it faces camera. So we've been looking at uh, multiple patterns uh, in the different types of mixed reality experience using hand menu and found some of the patterns. So uh, obviously raising an arm and maintaining a position is, uh, it could be quite fatiguing. So for, for the small and medium sized menu, it's uh, kind of okay to make it hand locked so you can easily show and do a quick action and hide. However, for the large and complex menu, uh, it could be a little bit overwhelming. So you have to maintain your hand and uh, uh, doing the interaction with the other hand 
Um, so it is recommended to make it word locked for this kind of menu. Uh, so when your hand is dropped, make it word locked and provide a close button and also allow the user to grab and move the menu. So here's an example. So, so this is a base behavior. So if you see, you need to hold uh, both hands to interact with the uh, complex UI. So definitely there's a usability issue. So this one is if you drop your hand, the menu is automatically word locked. So now in more stable position, you can interact with the menu. And of course you can grab and move and place it anywhere you want. You can close it. And of course you can bring up uh, any time if you want. Another example of allowing the user just directly grab and pull the menu and make it word locked, uh, kind of similar concept, um, but definitely improves the usability. Another a frequent uh, issue we found was uh, kind of this false activation. So if you have a hand menu in your experience and also you have a manipulation experience, then sometimes you can accidentally bring up this kind of hand menu uh, while interacting with the objects. So, Definitely uh, require flat hand is a really good option. So it, it won't show the menu until you see the flat palm. And another new addition uh, we did was uh, this kind of gaze activation option. So we did a, a lot of prototyping and testing and to see if we can add additional kind of logic. So here, as you can see, the menu does not show up until you actually take a look at your hand. So it really, kind of prevents false activation uh, if you don't uh, show your intention to use the hand menu. Another example with a large one, it does not show the menu until you take a look at the hand. So you can find these updated examples in the hand menu example scene an upcoming release of MRTK. And yeah, other examples of uh, nested menus. And again, similar patterns. If you drop your hand, the menu is word locked and you can grab and move the menu and you can easily interact with the uh, detailed UI components. And as I mentioned in Holland's two button section, uh, Holland's two button prevents uh, the back pressing. So you can easily achieve this kind of overlaid menu as well. So next topic is spatial awareness. So creating compelling interaction uh, is really possible using this uh, spatial mapping feature in HoloLens. So to use that, uh, you can use this MRTK's uh, spatial awareness profile. So you can simply just check this uh, spatial awareness system. Then you can configure the startup behavior and you can also configure this uh, display options. Um, so here are display options. Um, so first one is visible, uh, so it gives you both hand uh, spatial mesh and uh, occlusion. And the second one is occlusion only. So as you can see, it does not show the spatial mesh, but still the coffee cup is hologram is occluded by the physical object. And the third one is none. So in this case, you are not going to be able to see spatial mesh as well as the occlusion. So you only collides with the physical objects but it does not include the holograms. And another interesting component is uh, pulse shader. Uh, so using this shader, you can achieve this kind of uh, pulse effect around the spatial mesh. So you can check out this example scene to learn more about the spatial mapping feature. So there are many uh, great useful uh, components building blocks in MRTK. Well, we didn't have time today to go through all of these. There are slate, slider, a voice command feature, and dialogue, and hand coach, which is useful for instance guide. And there's some experiment features like a dock and scrolling object collection. And of course, there are a lot of exciting uh, eye tracking demo examples like a target selection with eye movement and heat map and positioning. Uh, so yeah, please check out those examples in MRTK GitHub. And so let me close with the documentation info. So if you go to MRTK GitHub, uh, there's a menu called Feature Guides. So if you click that, you can learn about all the details of these UX building blocks and MRTK's services. And if you go to aka.ms slash MR, our mixed reality dev center, 
in, if you go to design section, then you're going to be able to find this UX elements and controls and behaviors. So in here, you can find more design oriented guidelines. Uh, for example, this hand menu, we are sharing all of the uh, prototypes and the studies and the learnings that we uh, went through. So it's going to be quite useful for designing uh, spatial interactions. So finally, we also have a uh, sample apps on mixed reality design labs uh, on GitHub. So we are publishing this kind of uh, experimental uh, sample apps. Uh, this one is uh, something called the surfaces where we are experimenting with the uh, audio and visual for the fully articulated hand tracking and how to achieve this kind of uh, sensation of a tactile feedback. So yeah, thank you for joining the session today. And I hope uh, you, you could learn about the MRTK's exciting features. And we can't wait to see what you're going to build with MRTK's. Um, so yeah, if you have any questions, uh, please let us know. Great. All right, Julia and Yun, thank you so much for that presentation. Uh, just going to speak about what's been going on. There's been a little bit of a, a glitch with the software. So some questions came in, some didn't. All of this is going to be recorded. So people will be able to uh, to interact with you and, and learn about this uh, by watching it uh, recorded. But we did have a, a couple of questions that sort of snuck in. So we'll try to, to cover those. Um, one question I have is sort of what your target audience is for MRTK. Like, in other words, what level of, uh, or sophistication of designer are you really targeting with this type of a program? Julia, you want to go ahead? <clears throat> Sorry. Oh, sure. I think we're trying to target um, pretty broad range of people that kind of from students to kind of developers that um, kind of are working in the enterprise as well as um, in games. So the one requirement or the one thing that um, is still needed is to know the Unity game engine, but we're aiming to make it as easy to configure in the editor as possible by giving lots of examples for people to copy. And um, we're still still basically trying to to learn how to make that better. So if uh, people are finding anything confusing that to file issues on GitHub um, or ask questions on Stack Overflow or Slack would be great because we do look at those, um, trying to make it better. Cool, that's good to know. Um, I'm also wondering, or one of the questions that was asked was, um, is it possible to input data from other hand trackers, like from Leap or Oculus Quest? this program yeah we just announced the uh, the new version of mrtk uh, 2.4 yesterday and uh, that new version has uh, includes a leap motion support ultra leap so now you can uh, use the ultra leap sensors to simulate or this fully articulate hand tracking inside the unity editor so exciting all right um <clears throat> and then uh another question that came in is whether uh, these components are usable or available for mobile AR. I saw sort of a range of options in your presentation, but just wanted yeah. to kind of revisit the topic. Yeah, uh, definitely. Uh, as I mentioned uh, in the input section, so all of the uh, our uh, UX building blocks are uh, supporting a design for the multiple input types. So when you just uh, build and deploy to the mobile device, it just works. Uh, but uh, Another big challenge would be how can you refine uh, the polish, the experience for the mobile version. For example, the volume, volumetric buttons or sliders, some of them might wouldn't might won't work well for the mobile device. So that should be transformed into more screen-based UI, like uh, you know the flat 2D buttons on the top of the 2D screen. So uh, that aspect, uh, MRTK requires some more effort uh, uh, polishing the. Uh, the UI components and user experience for mobile device support, but uh, but yeah, definitely uh, you can use a lot of uh, components for mobile devices as well. Yeah. Great. Um, this may be a little repetitive to the question before, but uh, the question is: Do you see Microsoft moving towards providing tools that support non-Hololens AR platforms? 
Yeah, like you mentioned, um, the MRTK, you can actually uh, build it to run on the iPhone, on iOS, for example, or on Android. You literally just um, configure it to run on the phone, and then all of the controls will actually work and sort of with the, the phone's touch screen. So that is actually something that we're putting time into is supporting more platforms. So stay tuned. Great. And you know, the, the panel before this one was uh, all about Unity's Mars um, toolkit. So I think one of the questions, and again, a little related to, to this theme, um, will MRTK be part of Unity's Mars toolkit? How will those things start to integrate with other AR authoring platforms? So yeah, definitely we've been working closely with Unity. So uh, we're integrating the new uh, Unity's XR SDK. So that definitely for the Mars, uh, we are excited to work together with Unity to kind of uh, build a great experience for our developers. Uh, yeah. All right. Um, well, we're getting towards the end of our session and we're gonna have a quick turnaround in the panel, but I just wanted to check with you guys, see if there was anything that you wanted to sum up or add before we before we wrap up this particular panel. Uh, so yeah, we've been uh, since uh, the announcement of the HoloLens two and new version of MRTK. Yeah, we've been seeing so many exciting uh, hacks and contribution from the community. So we already see lots of MRTK's components are used for other devices and platforms like uh, you know, Oculus, uh, Quest, and other mobile devices. So. Yeah, it's a very exciting to see uh, all entire uh, industry industries are moving forward to this kind of new uh, uh, spatial canvas. So, uh, yeah, please uh, keep uh, uh, continuing sharing those kind of experimental project and exciting project, and also uh, don't hesitate to open a new issue and uh, to the feature request and uh, any uh, contributions. Uh, Beautiful. Well, it's very exciting times. It looks like an amazing uh, addition to to our knowledge and ability. Um, so I want to thank you guys for uh, presenting today. Really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you very much for joining the session. Yeah. All right. Take care.